Christian Faith Dialogue, a public affairs program at the crossroads of religion and life. A series of programs highlighting the social and cultural interaction between the worshiping and larger communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Area Conference of Churches in cooperation with KTBC. today's Austin Faith Dialogue. More than 1,000 people converged on San Antonio between May 22nd and June 1 as the first World Conference on Mission and Evangelism ever held in the United States met under the banner, Your Will Be Done, Mission in Christ's Way. Participants included about 500 delegates to a parallel conference called Encuentro. North American church leaders and laity gathered to observe the proceedings the first week, and 300 delegates to the Conference on Mission and Evangelism, representing 76 countries around the globe and various Protestant, Catholic, and Orthodox Christian communities. In addition, observers from Judaism, Buddhism, and other living faith traditions were present. Consultants to the conference included a Vatican delegation and eight conservative evangelicals. Hello, I'm Valerie Bridgman Davis, Outreach Pastor of the Shure Foundation Fellowship and your host for this edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. Today we will hear from local people who attended this historic meeting in San Antonio. With us today is Pete Hendricks, Professor of Mission and Evangelism at Austin Presbyterian Theological Seminary and an official observer of the conference. David Leslie with the Texas Conference of Churches or with the World Council of Churches who worked out of the Texas Conference of Churches here in Austin and served as the regional coordinator of the conference and Martha Murchison, a participant of the Parallel Conference in Quintero. Welcome to all of you, and we're glad to have you here. David, I want you to start us off today by telling us a little bit about what you did as the regional coordinator to get the conference going in Texas. I think one of the most important things with the work that I did and the work that I did with the Texas Conference of Churches, the Christian community in the state, was to put together ways that the World Council of Churches Conference could impact and be impacted by the Texas uh, religious community. I think so often these conferences come and they go and there's little contact with the local, with the local community. Uh, Texas is a big state and it has a lot of things to offer to people. Uh, people came to Texas with a lot of stereotypes and our hope was to break some of those down as well as to learn from people from other parts of the world. Um, I can, you know, go on later on and tell you some of the specifics, but that's the, that's the uh, purpose of the job that I had. Okay. And Pete, you can tell us a little bit about what the conference actually was. This is in a whole line of historic right. conferences, and would you just tell us what it was that the conference was actually? Right. Well, back in the 19th century, uh, Protestant missionaries went all over the world, mainly from the United States and Northern Europe they began to discover that they would bump into each other and uh, cr create confusion in countries. Uh, by the turn of the century, they started trying to get together. And uh, that getting together brought them into a series of conferences. And this conference in San Antonio is in that tradition of world mission conferences. Now that uh, missionary getting together created what we call the ecumenical movement. And that then eventuated in the World Council of Churches, and then it also brought about a number of conferences, and this conference in San Antonio was for the purpose of bringing people all over the world here. That first meeting in Edinburgh, Scotland in 1910, for example, 
everybody was uh, white, Northern European, uh, North American. And at this meeting, I would say that uh, three-fourths to four-fifths of the people uh, were people from Southern Hemisphere and uh, other countries than the North Atlantic countries. Okay, so really a great meeting. By Southern Hemisphere, you're talking Africa, South America. Yeah. Those mm -hmm. countries as opposed to North mm -hmm. America. Martha, you went as a participant of Encuentro, which was not a part of the World Conference on Mission and Evangelism, but was a parallel conference. Can you talk about the process of getting in that conference and what it was actually that you did as a participant in that conference? Yes, I had to apply back in November to become one of the 119 seminarians who were invited to become participants in Encuentro. Um, as a participant, I also took part in a parallel course that ran three days before the conference that was held at Bright Divinity School at Texas Christian University in Fort Worth. There we studied mission and evangelism in the global perspective and were taught by three Asian theologians. At the conference, I participated in encountering the delegates and observers from the World Conference and also in meeting the Christians from the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, I want us to talk a little bit about how this conference touched Texas. And uh, David, you can tell us a lot about that, but I, I guess I should say at this point that I also went as a member of Encuentro uh, in that conference. And so I can talk a little bit about how it touched Texas because it touched me. but. Would you just talk a little bit, David, about people leaving the conference and going into local uh, congregations and the logistics of that, and how many churches in Austin participated mm -hmm. in that? I think uh, you know, the conference touched Texas in many ways. Uh, you're alluding to the weekend visitations that delegates made to congregations in Texas. Uh, you know, a lot of what happens, anything that happens ecumenically, anything that happens in the mission field, has its base as, the, as a congregational base. I mean, you're supported by local congregations. Through the congregations, that's where you visit families, you get to see life in Texas, uh, and to experience some of the things that, you know, that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. However, that's only one part of where we made contact, but it was a very important part. In Austin alone, uh, we had something in the neighborhood of 15 congregations that hosted delegates on Memorial Day weekend. Uh, you went to Ebenezer Baptist Church, which is one of the, the churches, but we also had several Presbyterian, United Methodist, uh, United Church of Christ, Evangelical Lutheran. Uh, we covered the spectrum. Uh, we sent some, somewhere in the neighborhood of some 40 people to Austin from around the world that spent 24 hours in, in communities here in, the, in, in Austin. Uh, but it wasn't in Austin alone. Uh, logistically, at times, it was a bit of a nightmare, as on paper, it looked nice to send delegates to Muleshield, Texas, to <laughs> Lubbock, uh, out to Texarkana, to the Panhandle, to the Beaumont, Port Arthur area, to the Rio Grande Valley, as well as the other metropolitan areas like San Antonio, uh, Dallas, and Houston. Early, as, as I mentioned before, the, the mission of our, of our task was to provide a, a realistic exposure to a cross-section of Texas that you couldn't find just in San Antonio alone. So we, we, we sent them by uh, plane, uh, cars, uh, buses to get them to these, these towns so that not only could they have a uh, diverse encounter with racial ethnic communities, but also with rural urban uh, settings and uh, to see a variety of uh, mission programs. I want us to talk a little bit also about um what it is that we actually experienced at the conference. For instance, for me, I think I said when we were talking earlier that one of the most provocative things for me was the opening worship service, uh, where they said, now we will pray the Lord's Prayer in the language in which we have learned it, and to hear people pray in all different languages. I think a man from South Africa was behind me, a woman from Costa Rica was in front of me, a Greek Orthodox uh, was to the left of me, so I kind of heard four or five different languages just in my vicinity. Can you talk about, Pete and Martha especially, what actually happened at the conference that caught your attention? Well, while uh, 
uh, while that prayer was going on, all those people praying, I stopped and listened. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know for sure what the first day of Pentecost with all those many languages was like, but it must be something like that. It was a moving experience to realize that here I was uh, in the midst of all these Christians from all over the world, and it made me realize that this really is a, a movement, mm -hmm. uh, a Christian movement around the world, and that I'm one small part of that movement trying to make a contribution to it uh, right here. Martha, what about it I found you? that I f walking the Stations of the Cross and the Solidarity Service was extremely powerful. Tell us more about that. Um, in walking the Stations, we were reminded of the people who are suffering all over the globe and uh, people who are dying for their faith. I found it very threatening and yet exciting. Um, at times I was alone in this walk, and at times I was with people from all over the globe. Then I would be back alone again or in small groups. Um, it reminded me that I do have a large part to play. Tell me a little bit about the Solidarity Walk. What kinds of things did you do on the walk? We went to various stations and had a meditation written by someone from a different country to read it at each of the stations. One of the stations we imposed ashes on ourselves and one we actually helped others carry a huge cross around a courtyard. One we chose to write a sin that of either our collective um, consciousness or our own individual consciousness and hammer it into a board. David, is there anything um, logistically that made the conference particularly hard to hold in Texas, aside from the distance in Texas? We know you couldn't send anybody to El Paso, but was there anything else that made the conference hard to plan or hard to get together or hard to keep together? Right. Well, we actually did send someone to El Paso. You did. We got teams to El Paso. We tried to get them everywhere. Um, I think the size is, is just a fundamental problem. Uh, I think that San Antonio is not the easiest city to get to either by air when you're coming from, from various international spots. Uh, some of the scheduling for airlines was uh, rather confusing at times. Uh, I think uh, in Texas also there is um, a bit of caution about the World Council of Churches. Uh, in, my, you know, in all honesty in the work that I did, uh, I had to, we had to face the fact that the World Council of Churches is not always the, uh, uh, will not be the most well thought of organization. I think 60 Minutes and Reader's Digest, uh, you know, have done pieces on the World Council of Churches, which tends to stereotype what goes on. So we had to work through a lot of the preconceptions, um, a lot of the stereotypes to get World Council at least get people open to, um, you know, allowing the World Council to come into the communities. Uh, while I say that, of course, there are, there are a lot of very, very supportive people here, too. So that, uh, on one hand, the work was difficult, the sizes were immense, but uh, I had something like 300 volunteers that I worked with all around the state, which tend to make it a very small community and very manageable. Uh, the people in Geneva said, call David, our man in Texas. <laughs> and I think the conference wouldn't have come off as well as it did if it hadn't been for David. David. Uh, is a Texan. His father's a pastor here in the state, so he was able to uh, keep the local touch, if, mm -hmm. if you will. Another thing that's important is that uh, the people who came here and the people who were preparing the conference in Geneva uh, wanted all the participants to know about the church in Texas. And so uh, an issue of the International Review of Missions was uh, published uh, you can see the state of Texas outlined uh, here on it, and the articles in it are about various uh, church happenings mm -hmm. that are taking place in in Texas. For example, you you were we were talking about your having preached over at Ebenezer Baptist here. Well, Marvin uh, Griffin has an article in here about Black Baptist in. And Marvin is the pastor. And he's the pastor Ebenezer, of the Ebenezer Ebenezer uh, Church. And then there are about other ministries uh, here in the state, and people, uh, if we had time to go into them, would recognize a lot of those. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about the um, experience we had with people, apart from the structured things that happened at the conferences, because there were several structured conferences and conversations, which we have not really talked about. But I found 
probably the most enlightening was the conversations outside of the structure. Mm -hmm. And so, um, Martha, I do want you to tell us a little bit, since you probably had a little bit more interaction than even David, who was probably behind the scenes a lot, uh, about conversations with people from other places, other communions, mm -hmm. other traditions. I enjoyed very much, particularly the dinner hours, because we all sat together and ate together, mm -hmm. and I never knew what nationality of person I would sit by. And every time I noticed I sat down to eat, someone would say, how is it with women in seminary mm -hmm. in Texas, in the United States? Can women get a pastorate? What's it like for them? Do they still have to struggle? And we exchanged stories of struggle in our country and in their country. Once I had a Catholic nun look to me and say, we look to you as women in the Protestant faith to pave the way for us to become ordained as priests. Mm -hmm. What was it like to see people from different traditions at the regalia, for instance, uh, the Orthodox Church, um, they came in full garb, which was exciting for me. Was there anything about that? that I enjoyed greatly uh, getting to know what other people wear as regalia of their faith. The Coptics in particular had beautiful vestments. I spent a lot of time with a Catholic friend of mine finding out what each of their vestments or a garb meant and why they wore it. Mm -hmm. I found it uh, pointing to a lot of what I don't know about faiths of other people in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, Pete, what about for you, formal or informal conversation? Well, I, I sought out several people just to do interviews with them. One was a man from North India. Mm -hmm. He's the uh, rector of the St. Paul Cathedral in Calcutta, and that's a church of 800,000 people in the midst mm -hmm. of a predominantly Hindu uh, community, and talked to him about the life of the church. I must say that uh, it sounded uh, as boring and as <laughs> <laughs> difficult uh, as problem-filled, as uh, happy, as important as uh, a lot of churches I'm around here in the, in the States. Um, and I found some of that uh, same uh, feel in interviewing a man, a young man, just a year out of seminary from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. But uh, then I ran on to other people where the, I guess the whole dynamic of growth and expansion was, was at work. In other words, a lot of our denominations here in the states, at least what we call mainline denominations, have kind of slowed down. And you get a reflection of that in churches around the world. But just as we have groups here that are growing and expanding, that's going on around the world. And as you know, uh, for example, what were there, something like 8 million uh, Christians in Africa at the turn of the century, and now there are maybe 250 million or mm -hmm. 300 million. Mm -hmm. It's just grown rapidly, and they're Part, other parts of the world where that kind of expansion has taken place. So I was meeting the kind of problems that I know about here as working with training pastors, and I was also seeing some of the dynamics. So that was so terrific. You, you saw a lot of sameness, a lot of continuity in the mm -hmm. Christian faith around the globe, mm -hmm. and also some of the differences that That's come right. up because of the context people are in. Mm -hmm. That's good. I um, was saying that I spoke with a man from the Philippines who was a United Church of Christ minister. And uh, we talked for three or four hours, it was. And he had said that he had thought that the Christians in the United States didn't care. And his coming to the conference said, yes, we did. Mm -hmm. And here we were in full force. He was especially um, impressed by the Encuentro people who were there and didn't have to be there as delegates and saying, yes, you do care. but. One of the other things that struck me, David, and maybe you can speak to this, were there were some very difficult problems. For instance, for the people coming out of mainland China who came to the conference, were there other things like that that just made it real poignant to know that there we were with people who were in conflict for their faith? Oh, yes. I think that the, you, you mentioned the Chinese situation. Uh, the dormitory in which I was staying in was what we called the high security dormitory. Uh, we had not only the Chinese delegation, but we also had the delegation from Russia. Uh, so we had every night at 10 o'clock, the Chinese would gather around the TV trying to get news of the situation in China. Uh, we had the 
course, we had the Armenian situation still fresh on many people's minds. Uh, you go to these international events, and I think what's so powerful, uh, my first exposure two years ago, is that at any international conference like this, you have major crises occurring at, at a given moment, things that are touching people's lives that, uh, as Martha said uh, just a moment ago, that are very abstract. Uh, but when you meet someone and you get to, you're sharing with that, I mean, it's, it's a moment of uh, solidarity. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in addition, in addition to this, we had a delegation from Poland. The elections were about ready to happen at the early part of the conference. So there were a lot of international things that were, were taking place that uh, I know it must have been very difficult for the delegates. I, I know that you know being away and yet still participating fully in the conference, it must have been a lot of struggle with them, as well as our own struggle in our own North American context that we are suddenly having to face this is not only uh, uh, body of Christians, but as, as Americans and how we relate to that. So, uh, Valerie, the uh, Chinese group that was here, six or eight, was the first official church delegation from China since the People's Republic of China was established around 1949-50. Um, at, at a world conference. At a world right? conference. Mm -hmm. uh, individuals have kind of come out uh, to some meetings, but this was the first official group. Uh, I was able to interview them and talk to them and find out some of how they felt about the student situation. They left just before it got really hot in uh, mm -hmm. Beijing, but uh, the church there, though a minority, very rapidly growing minority, but uh, nonetheless a group that's been persecuted heavily up until the last 10 years, uh, they are in full support and have uh, issued letters. Now, no telling what kind of trouble they're in now right. in mm -hmm. support of the students and the students in the square in, in Beijing mm -hmm. uh, and all. And we simply have not heard now what's happening to the church. Right. But we all need to pray for not only the church there, but all the, that situation. Martha, also there was a delegation from South Africa and you yes. were pri privileged, we were privileged to hear from Alan Bosek, who is a pastor, black pastor in South Africa. Do you want to tell us anything about that experience? Yes, um, we were very privileged to hear Alan Bosek twice. He spoke of the need for Christians in America to express their solidarity with the church in South Africa. So often in South Africa they feel that we don't care and we ask him what we could do because we, many of us do indeed want apartheid to end. He asked us to write our congressmen, our senators, to ask for sanctions. Those types of things would really make a difference for them. And we're winding down here, but I do want to say um, there was also another group of people at the conferences that we haven't talked about, but they were people from other living faiths, non-Christians, <laughs> Jew Jews, people from Buddhism, some Native American religions. Um, you want to talk about there what eight of them Dave how many were at the conference the numbers fluctuate but mm -hmm. there were 12 official observers mm -hmm. and probably at different points along the, the path that there were uh, uh, you know different numbers at different times of course we also had uh, local people from San Antonio entering in at sp specific times of course uh, Pete's the one to address the whole issue between the the dialogue with other living face uh, it's going to be a major issue for uh, mainline Christianity as well as the World Council in the years to come. Do you want to say something about that, Pete? Well, it, it was a major issue at, uh, at this conference. And uh, I have in my hand one of the uh, books written by a World Council staff person, the Bible and other faiths. And he's, he's trying to, the traditional way Christians have thought about persons in other faiths is that uh, the Christian religion is the one true religion. Well, he's trying to find in Scripture uh, and he's pressing pretty hard, but he's trying to find uh, some fresh scriptural ways to think about the relationship of Christian people with Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, and others. And uh, so the World Council struggles on that point and in a way kind of explores. And that means that, um, well, they get on thin ice and a lot of people think they're uh, uh, checking out on the Christian faith. I think, uh, while some of their views are too liberal for me, I know, 
it is important to have some group as a kind of think tank in in this area and the world council people are trying on that front but let me say they their statement is you can't belong to the world council unless you affirm that jesus christ is god and savior and that's about as strong a theological conviction statement as you can have the last thing i want you to tell us about real quickly pete is you're going to another conference in july called lausanne yeah. too it's a meeting of evangelical christians right. from around the globe how is that different from what we have done and how is it alike well one of the sad things in the christian world protestant world mainly is that uh, growing from this missionary movement in the last century you've had an ecumenical stream and the meeting in san antonio represented that group still very strong about evangelism proclamation of the gospel but have tried to face in a i'd say in a very strong and forthright and proper way issues of the environment uh, issues of justice uh, all around the world now the meeting in lausanne uh, focuses 90% uh, on world evangelization and uh, would be more conservative theologically, more intent upon evangelization. The two would share that in common. And there are a lot of people there, though, who are concerned about justice mm -hmm. issues. But nonetheless, the church is divided in those ways. And so we find ourselves, although we are ecumenical, still striving to become what we need to be. Mm -hmm. As we come to the close of today's discussion, I want to thank you, Pete and Dave and Martha, for having been with us and for the information and the inspiration you provided us today. We are encouraged by the ecumenical vision you have given us. On behalf of the Austin Metropolitan Ministries, I'm Valerie Bridgman Davis, thanking you for joining us and inviting you to be with us next week at this same time. Peace to you.